Reckless, the AD carry of Alliance, formerly of Fnatic, is a player who on, on paper seemingly has it all, the complete package, a person who could go on to become maybe the best Western player of all time in League of Legends, really this sort of a talent and sort of profile player. And yet there's, there's a, a crucial factor, principle behind his game that means that that at the moment is not going to happen seems unlikely that it'll happen in the future and it hasn't happened so far so let's think of think of all the things he has going for him as a player amazing statistics if you look on paper just consistent output of great stats throughout the stat sheet tournament after tournament game after game his numbers are always great on paper you go without looking at the game you go this is everything i need this is a, this is a star player this is a superstar this might be the best western player statistically mechanically what a great player one of the best players probably ever produced by the West. Might even currently be the guy with the best mechanics overall, both in terms of like skill, just incredible accuracy, speed, but also smooth, mechanics polished, refined, everything you want mechanically. He's youthful. He's a young guy and he's only, must be about 18 now. And yet he's got experience and he's not a player who seems to get crippled by nerves and gets destroyed by that you think of a lot of western players a lot of them we, we always build them as well oh they're so talented and one day they'll be good but oh you know it's their first lands now and you know they're still young so they're still it's understandable they're nervous doesn't seem to have any of these problems his, his performance seems quite consistent from tournament to tournament from region going up levels amateur to pro to the international level similar sort of play and performance at all these levels that seems like that should be a huge positive for him he doesn't get affected in that way in terms of just the aesthetic, he's a good looking guy, he's got a lot of fangirls as a result, he's a guy who, very good, what you'd call like a clean cut image if you were in the West, he has a great on camera personality, he comes across as like humble but confident, he doesn't seem cocky, seems like a likeable figure, as a result he's got a huge personal fan base, it, I mean Fnatic as a team always had a bigger fan base but it seems like his fan base extends beyond that because before he was definitely in Fnatic during that Amad period people were very hyped around him. It feels like some Fnatic fans have left and gone over with him to Alliance. There's a lot of people want to see him do well and think that he can do well. He's got seemingly when you go down like that, everything's going for him. And yet, I don't think I'm being unfair if I say that to me. When when I read other people's opinions of Reckless and I see how he's built in line with all these factors here, I think he might be the most overrated player in the entire world. Definitely in the West. Now let, let's think about some of the other players that that exist out there. Okay. Bjergsen, he's another person who at times has been a candidate for most overrated, but he's also seriously come through. Like Bjergsen can be up and down, definitely. He might be the most up and down of all the superstar players in the West. But his highs and when he can deliver them can be incredible. Like this guy can carry very hard sometimes. The LCS Summer Playoffs this year was a great example of that, where even in games where his teams were shit, sometimes he was just carrying the whole game, soloing it, giving them a chance to win. Froggen known for that passive style of play people like to look if you're a fan of flashy plays and dominance in the mid lane people might think he doesn't dominate but actually you go back through the year and you look at the wins that alliance has and in something like 95 percent of their wins you'd find that froggen was the best player the player had the most impact on the game the player who kept them in a game or the player who pushed it out and play was the deciding factor it would be froggen meteos from cloud nine dominated San Jose, this IEM tournament recently, no one could stand against him. He was a, an entire level above every other jungler in the tournament, including Shook, who's been very much hyped as Europe's best jungler all year long. In this sense, Reckless does not dominate. On the stat sheet, Reckless is very dominant. He's the most dominant Western player on the stat sheet. But when you look, when you stop looking at a piece of paper or a computer screen with numbers on it, and you actually start watching the game with your eyes, you won't see this dominance. Like some of these players I've just referenced here, you won't find one tournament where in terms of play on the screen and what he does to the opponent and the intimidation and the fact, the aura that comes just from his play and the effect that it had, he was the dominant force in every game and dominated a whole tournament, you won't find it. You won't find it game to game that he's dominating and putting on stretches of four games where he's a god and then this one where he totally outclasses that guy a million percent. You're just not going to find it. That, in general, is not there in Reckless's game. And so, taking these two factors together, this incredible profile of a seemingly on paper everything you'd want in a player, to especially to be the best Western player, to be the hope for as good, can be as good as Koreans, like we always want to hype for the best Western player, and get these flaws where he's not having this massive game impact that we think even the other star superstar Westerners are having. 
what's the disparity here? What's going on? Well, let's set the scene first on who Reckless is, because I think it's crucial to give some context. So historically, a lot of people know him from the end of 2012, like the, after season two, coming into season three, when he had this DreamHack winter event, and the, which Fnatic won over CLGU, and then he went to IPL5 and they came second. It was an incredible run, and people think of that as his breakout. It was when he broke out as a player. But actually, he'd even been to international tournament before that. He went to MLG Summer Arena with a team called Black, and he played there as just some nobody, and he was playing as Zubu Blaze and TSM. And the reason why I bring that up is because that means even in season two, going into season three, he already actually had pretty solid experience under his belt. Now then, he got hamstrung a bit because he was too young. He had to play the amateur scene in 2013, so he fell back a bit in terms of a profile. But then he comes into Fnatic, an amazing start to the first split. They were like seven games in a row, and his stats were fucking unbelievable like he hadn't died or something and he had like an insane kda and then obviously they had the really bad seven games where he, his numbers were still good but the team were, couldn't just couldn't find a way to win then they went to iem katowice and they beat cloud nine again and they got to the final then admittedly got beat up by kt bullets overall Fnatic got their shit together in that spring split they won the playoffs pretty convincing fashion overall after the close game against alliance in the final very convincing win over sk they win another split Seems like all going great so far. Summer split, Fnatic really levels out. They're just like 50% win rate the majority of the time. They pick it up towards the end. They they narrowly get through the semi-final series against Rockout. That, that, that really could have gone either way. In the final, they get pretty much outclassed by by Fnatic and uh, Alliance. And as a result, some people even think of them, think when they just look at how the playoffs went, like in the playoffs at least, SK was probably the second best team in that tournament. Fnatic was probably the third, but the way it went and having a better record and getting the better side of the bracket, they got to finish second. They go to Worlds. Obviously, they have some good games. They beat Samsung Blue. Then they have some pretty lackluster games. The game against OMG was actually a bit of a clusterfuck for everyone. Playing against LMQ. Yeah, sometimes convincing. Sometimes what the fuck was going on there. Like, overall, not such a great tournament overall for you. Fnatic. Admittedly, you were in the group of death. So, overall, decent World Championship. And then IEM San Jose. Actually, this was one of the better tournaments. Probably his best tournament in terms of consistent performance and having some impact on the game. But, again, couldn't, like, hard carry the game. They got beaten by Cloud9, Froggen, Shook, other members of the team played like shit, lost that tournament. So overall, when you look at it, again, you look through this whole history and th there isn't really these periods where he's the oh, absolutely the best player, like dominating the game, game impact, incredible player. That tournament, you'll never forget how he took the whole tournament over. It's not really there in his history. But the reason why I reference a lot of the context here is also because I want to make the point that this isn't that, that old stereotype we've been sold of the western young player of like oh he, and he hasn't been blooded yet and he has to get some experience under his belt and you know he's a bit nervous going to big lands so once he gets that out of his way a bit like people like Bjergsen had initially you know that's not the case for Reckless who Reckless is now is a product of a lot of tournaments a lot of play a lot of thought and improvement and going in different teams and he's actually the finished product at this point now he can still progress he can still change his mentality he can still develop as a player and find his role and exert himself and say i want to learn new things that's all totally the case but you shouldn't assume it will happen just on the basis that he's young or that he's still relatively new in the scene like because he's really not in those senses in game terms this guy's a veteran now actually he's got years under his belt he's going to many tournaments he's going to way more international tournaments than nearly any other western player that's currently active if you think about this context for him that's why you have to be able to criticize Reckless because people are not only calling him the best European player, they're calling him the best Western player. And not only that, they're going beyond that. Like when people talk about Froggen or they talk about Bjergsen, they say like, oh, they're the best Western mids or they're the best in the West even. But then they'll always be like, of course, they can never compete with Faker. And, you know, um, Cool maybe would get them and Pawn when they see Beat Faker. Oh, I'm sure Pawn would kill him as on Dade, which is incredible in OGN. And, and they don't really suggest that these players could truly compete they could have a good game but they wouldn't truly compete people talked about reckless coming into worlds for real as if he was going to be right there with uzi I, right there with name with imp with deft and that he would either compete with or he would just beat these guys and he really could and it was capable that he could do it and okay maybe his bot lane wouldn't be as strong as one or two of these bot lane, but he personally could be up there and he could do give the same performance in the tournament as those players could and would which I mean, that was a bit of unrealistic when you look back now. So that's part of the reason why we have to have this context for him. Because people aren't just putting him up as a good player or one of the best or a good... They're putting him up as potentially the best and they're putting him on the level of these players who are super carries for their teams. Now let's talk about these negatives. What is this issue here? The simplest way to say it is he has very little game impact when Fnatic loses a game. I've seen Fnatic because we've only seen like three games in Alliance. 
when he was in Fnatic, part of the problem was that spring split to me is the perfect epitome of this. In the games they won and he had the incredible stats, okay, great. And the whole team was doing well, but his stats are great. You don't even have to worry about anything there because they're winning every game. But then the games they were losing, the seven games they lost, his stats were still fucking wonderful. His stats were awesome. But you know what? They were losing every game. And you go and look into the game and you weren't seeing any impact. He's a guy where I'm going to have to go mainly off Fnatic stuff here. I, it did change a little bit for IAM San Jose, so I have hope for the future potentially. He's a guy who, when losing, it feels like he refuses to commit to risky play or to try to out, mechanically outplay an opponent or to go into a fight and know that, listen, I'm probably going to die in this fight, actually. The way the team fights go at the moment in the game, we're behind a bit, but I have to go all out and I have to try some incredible shit right now, old school gambit style. I, I have to be the one who wouldn't turns this fight around. Instead, he's the guy where he, he doesn't really do that in the losing games. And then in winning games, in general, he's not really the guy who takes his lane. And if he's winning it a bit, goes, right, you know what? Fuck it. I'm better than that player. I've got a better champion. And the lane's going better. I'm going to snowball this whole lane. I'm going to carry this whole game before we even get to the team fight. And we're going to win the game off my back. He doesn't really do that in general. And he was playing with the best Western support. A guy who, listen, he's not matter. Yellow Stars isn't matter. But he was our Western equivalent of matter. Playmaking support. Guy who gives great vision. Guy who's mechanically skilled and wants to make plays in the lane. He had exactly what you would want if you wanted to be the hard, dominant AD carry in the West. And there wasn't really anything going on there in the laning phase. Then you get to the team fights. And you've got this safe player who doesn't like to take risks. And almost refuses to dominate the laning phase, just wants to farm. And the problem here is, then you go and do the team fight, and you know what? He doesn't have any peel. He doesn't get any peel as a player. He just sits around the outside. He does his damage. He tries not, he, he refuses to go in a position where he'll die. So he just does his damage until he can die and then moves back and goes back and does some more damage, goes back. Just, just is just damage dealing purely, but never committing and having a chance to kill everything, but also die. Just going to play safe and see what the game gives me. Whatever it gives me is what I'll take it, but I'll never demand more. I'll never try to take more for myself. Now, listen, within the context of what I just described there, the way he played, that makes absolute sense. I understand why Fnatic would use him that way. That's the correct way to fit him in in terms of what he seems to want to do in the game. But the problem here is that isn't who he has to be as a player. I'm going to just talk about his style after this, so maybe I can actually address some of the reasons as to why I actually understand that style, but it's not necessarily the right style for him. Because he could snowball lanes. He could be a dominant player. He could be this incredible team fight presence that you remembered after every game that they lost. Like, well, he was still keeping a minute. What a great player. And the games they won, oh, he was the factor that won them that whole game. So talking about like how sick he could be in lane. You remember after the ADC item rework when they, they fucked with all the the Infinity Edge, etc. His Lucian for a little while afterwards was like next level shit that no one in the West was quite able to get to the level of. Like that whole debate between him and Tabs, which I always thought was quite relevant throughout the LCS splits. During that little period, Reckless was a level above. Like he was really fucking good during that period. This is a guy who can play Vayne, who has shown sometimes that he does want to play Vayne. In theory, the seeds are all there. He could be a hyper carry. He could be this dominant Uzi Ai, Name, like Name type guy you base the team around, Uzi Ai type game, smashes lane every time. He could be that sort of guy. He just refuses to, it seems, in terms of mentality. And if, and if it is true that his team in any way looks at him and goes, well, we won't give him those roles, if you're the superstar guy, you demand that. I'm sorry, Uzi Ai doesn't go, oh, guys, um, am I going to be playing the carry role? Am I going to try and win lane this step? He goes, I'm doing that this time. I'm the best player in this team. I get... You know, you base the team around me and everyone else knows he's the best player and they all fall the fucking line. And that's why this guy dominates the game. <laughs> when we talk about Reckless's style, you're going to see why these tendencies emerge and why this is a problem if you want to be the superstar. Because, some sorry, the superstars in general are the super carries. They have incredible game impact, even if they're not literally a carry like a mid lane. Like you can be a jungler like Meteos, but you have to have huge game impact. Whether that's in team fights or ganking or whatever it is, you can be a support and do it. You have to be a playmaker. You have to shield your AD carry, you have to get to a certain thing, you have to peel for people, have great CC. No matter what the role is, you can be the carry. Reckless hasn't really done it. So first of all, the way I think about Genja at double lift is a way I think is actually a bit unique because from following his career quite closely, reading interviews about him and from him, I actually think of, of Reckless as a fusion. So he, let's go with the Dragon Ball Z thing that people always like to do. He's like the fusion dance equivalent of Double Lift and Genja. And the reason I pick those two totally disparate, if you have the spectrum of how to play AD carry, the passive safe style, the super ham 
balls deep style that doublelift's on, Genji's here, they're at the opposite ends. And yet he's like the fusion marriage of the two. But the problem is, he's the marriage of the two over on the Genja side. It's like he has the super godlike sick mechanics of the double lift season two type guy who wants to carry and be the hyper carry, but he doesn't have the same mentality of that. He has the super sick mechanics and he takes it over to the Genja, very safe style when it comes to the team fight. That's the thing, okay, with, with and, and listen, in terms of champions, he can place them in the double lift champions, but he'll play them in the Genja style. Now listen, the key thing about Genja was, Genja made his style work for him and he pioneered that style. The Genja style, was was tailored not entirely consciously i think due to the players finding the right niche of what they were supposed to do in the team was so well tailored to the moscow five gambit style because the thing is in genja's world he never wanted to smash lane and go for kills he just wanted to farm up he wanted to get his items he wanted to get to the team fight and then in the team fight he was never going to be the hard hyper carry all he was going to do was sit around the outside taking being the most risk averse player so he would never die he refused to ever die that's why he was the one of the guys who was one of the pioneers to always get that defensive the right defensive item at the right time instead of that last whisper or whatever his job is never die but just keep doing continual damage and here's the key thing he's never going to be the focus he doesn't need the peel because his style is he's never the main focus at that. He's just an annoying little nut on the outside doing lots of damage and then last hitting people and just getting that kill in when it was close and, and only swarming when everyone else has gone in and committed from the rest of the team. He's never going to be that hyper carry. That was what Genji was never going to do. But within his team, that was beautiful because first of all, G Gambit and Moscow 5 were never going to give Genji any peel. He's one of the only AD carries, a really high level one, who never played with peel in his entire career. He had no fucking person peeling people off him, CCing enemies who were trying to get him. Instead, the whole team, when you were in Gambit and Moscow 5, was about the others all went ham. Alex Itch goes ham. Darian goes ham. Diamond Prox engages like a motherfucker. Edward, Gosu Pepper, all in there, in their faces, kind of go in. But their whole job is to focus, get, get this chaotic fight going but the focus of gambit was alex itch when all of this is going on alex itch is picking his moment that he will come in and carry this whole team fight and get all the kills and secure everything and so the other four are super super aggressive and all working co and coordination and all know our job is keep alex itch alive meanwhile you've got genja that allows him to not be a focus but as a result to be free to just move around and not die and just do the damage and if he does that combined with what they did that's why this was a legendary godlike team where when you explain it like that you'd think some mad genius had come up with that whole system and then we're going to balance this out by doing this and this guy will be seem like he's out of whack here but this guy will sort of tone it down by balancing the overall measure of aggression and passivity and knowing this guy's going to be very safe news so this guy can be a bit more chaotic like the darian style just go nuts and You'd think it genius had designed this, but no. It's just somehow the way they the team formed and developed together and but that's why it worked for the Genja style. The problem in the reckless case is that it doesn't make as much say, sense to do this because no one would have ever called Genja the main carry of his team and no one at least beyond certain parts in season two and, and every now and then, no one really was ever gonna compare Genja in a modern context as like, oh, all-time greatest AD carries ever in terms of carries and star players. Well, I've got Genja, then we've got Uzi Guy, then we've got Wei Sharp. No, those are the ones that kept on another level because they're the main focal point carry of their whole team. And so the problem here is if if you want to be the Genja type guy, you can do it. You were doing it for Fnatic. It was even working quite well a lot of the times. But in the same way as Genji was never going to come from behind and carry the whole game that you're losing and take the risky plays, Reckless has not done that either. Now, I wonder if some of this comes down to talking to Genji, because actually I remember some interviews before Season 3 World Championships started where Reckless actually said that he'd, he was one of the guys who'd been talking to Genji and sharing builds with him, and that's where the Triforce Cogmore came up that Genji famously used against Samsung. Well, it's white now, but it was Ozone back then. And so I wonder if somehow he actually, there's some conscious aspect to him. Maybe he's patterned some aspects of his game off Genja because he's a very intelligent player. The thing is, I don't mind if he wants to be that sort of player. But if he want, if we're going to have Rekas as this superstar dominant force that is as great as an AD, an Uzi Ai, a Name, Imp, Deft, a lot's got to change. And by the way, when I say that, I know already some people are going to be like, what do you mean? Name was shit at Worlds and Deft had those couple of games he was bad and they lost to Fnatic in a game, yeah. And uh, Imp has all these great players on his team and Uzi Ai. Well, they probably won't say anything about Uzi Ai because no one ever criticised him. But here's the problem. Beyond even just Worlds, those guys have fucking phenomenal track records domestically. Imp has been a super sick bot lane carry 
for so many OGN seasons, it's ridiculous. And before he got Mata, he used to be the main star. The whole team used to carry every single game and from behind was the only chance to win a game and has had some very sick laning performances and wants to smash lane every time. You go to Name. I know people don't know this now because they only watch Worlds, but Name has made something ridiculous like 14 finals of domestic tournaments in China and has won like 12 or something, you know. And this year, there was 10 domestic tournaments. He was in the final of all 10. Nine of them were lands, and he won eight of them, including both the LBL splits. The whole team's based around him. They can't win domestically these big tournaments, all the best Chinese teams, unless he is the main focal point carry. And crucially, they can get to those points where he brings them back in team fights. So Nam is off the table again. Go to Deft now. Domestically, Deft was a fucking god. This guy was the reason you would win the game in the team fight. Now, Dade, to a degree, would look like he was because he would have a lot of the incredible fancy plays, etc. But the difference is, Deft's damage dealing wasn't from a safe position. He'd be right in there dealing all this godlike insane damage, but then perfectly dodging all of your CC and all your attacks back. So he was always in, in that boxing term, term of like inside the pocket where like you're, you're getting your hits off, but you could also be hit. He was right in there. He was never like miles away with a reach advantage hitting. Like he was right in there risking getting knocked the fuck out, but so that he could do insane damage, the most damage output of anyone in the whole world probably. And this is a guy where in, in fights, he could lose a game and still end up with some fucking ludicrously high damage output for like the tournament, for that match, for that series, just a phenomenal carry level player. Reckless is not on this level and when we're talking about in this context. He's a very good player, he's got a lot going for him, but he has not embraced this aspect. Now, I don't know whether he will in the future, maybe this is his personality, but people should never compare a player and put, give, you should never give someone the crown before they've actually earned it and proved that they're the king and actually defeated these people in a legitimate way and in a way where it's not just that you win because you have a better team or a better te teammate here or an unusual strength here. You have to do it actually as an individual player and on merits of what you did in the context of your team.